Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be back in, uh, in Limerick. Uh, but you did want uh, an award-winning speaker, didn't you, from, uh, from the UK? Uh, and I am one. Uh, unfortunately, the award was for cycling proficiency in uh, 1967, but uh, we'll see how we go. Um, the song that was playing just uh, as you sat down, just before David stood up, uh, some of you recognised it and some of you actually asked if it could just carry on and uh, when the LP had finished from Dark Side of the Moon we all went down the pub but um, I don't know if any of you listened to the words us and them so it was chosen uh, as this first image of Muhammad Ali knocking down uh, Sonny Lister um, and the reason I've put up that picture is Muhammad Ali, as we all know, um, was a great uh, advocate for civil rights uh, and did a lot trying to repair the huge uh, rifts in society in the States. Uh, but he was also a good poet. Uh, we know he was a good, a good speaker uh, and used to write little ditties to wind up his opponents. But um, he was asked by Oxford Union to, to talk to them, which he did. And he started off by reading them a, a poem he had written. Uh, and I will just, just read you the poem. Me, we. And that's all he said. And uh, when people had thought about what he'd said, he got a huge round of applause. And one minor error David got in his introduction about me, um, I think you said international developer. Well, I don't do international other than for holidays and for lovely visits to places like this because development involves the communities and planning and politics and all politics is local and all communities you know, are very complex and very local and I have found that it takes a huge amount of time and energy to, to understand the places that you are trying to evolve, not place make you know, all the places we go to are already in existence. So it's a bit disingenuous to say we're coming in and we're suddenly going to make a place. You know, we are arriving in communities that have had hundreds, sometimes even longer than that, to establish themselves. So uh, we are coming in to work with those communities and work with the politicians. And I have just experienced over the past few years, and I'm sure you guys do as well, um, and you only have to turn on the news now to, to see that society seems to be becoming uh, very divided in, in many areas. And I don't know if you could just do the slide, Jonathan. Um, I don't really want to get depressed about uh, uh, Brexit uh, and the us and them that's happening in the UK at the moment, but uh, here are some of the uh, promoters of how good Brexit will be. Um, and it just beggar's belief really how anyone could look at those characters and think if they think it's a good idea you know, it obviously can't be but uh, no one did what could possibly go wrong with that bunch of characters you know, saying what a jolly good thing it will be um, I do have some, some very thoughtful friends you know, who do think in the long term uh, Brexit will be good not particularly uh, uh, because it will be good for the UK but it will be uh, good to be out of Europe uh, if Europe carried on going the direction it was going, but um, they are in the minority and I am uh, very personally worried about uh, what's happening there. If you look at other divisions in society, uh, the Gini coefficient, I'm sure uh, most of you know that is um, um, a calculation about the rich and the poor and the haves and have-nots. Uh, it has got slightly worse in the UK, uh, but not that much worse. Um, and I did look at the um, social divides you know, in this part of Ireland over the past few hundred years. You know, and certainly, you know, 100, 150 years ago, this part of Ireland you know, had a much worse Gini coefficient if it had existed then uh, with the haves and have-nots. But it does feel particularly bad at the moment uh, with Donald Trump uh, and with the haves and the have-nots and with the homeless uh, and the people that have a roof over their head. And I was just talking to Sheila that in the UK at the moment, uh, apparently we have a housing crisis and I will come on to that at the moment in, 
a little bit later on. Um, but in the UK, there are more bedrooms per head of population than at any other time in the history of Britain. Just have a think about that. Let's go to the next slide, Jonathan. But it's not just uh, the Brexiteers and the non-Brexiteers or the black and the white in the civil rights movement. Uh, we are getting splits in our society between uh, the elderly and the young. Um, and if you go on to the next one, Jonathan, um, one of the um, very good things about uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, was how he encouraged the young to get out and vote in the recent uh, election in the UK. Now, he might have done that uh, by uh, offering to uh, stop uh, uh, university fees and pay back all the, uh, all the loans that people had had out, but you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Pandering to, uh, to the electorate uh, and the Tory party uh, has for decades been just as bad in slightly different ways. Um, but this man, who I'm sure most of us look back fondly to and thinking, why couldn't there be someone as upstanding and as honest and as sensible as him running uh, the great free world? Um, it's funny how perspectives change, isn't it? Um, but this is him, at, uh, the scheme I was involved with in Birmingham at Brindley Place, talking to Mavis. Um, and um, of course, he is famous for lots of things, but um, more particularly for saying it's the economy, stupid. Some of you will remember that. Um, um, what seems to be lacking, uh, certainly in my experience, business um, very much is at fault here, is explaining to the population, to communities, that there is no such thing as public money. It actually comes from individuals, private sector businesses, you know, working, creating wealth, uh, and then distributing that wealth through taxation. And she was an expert on, uh, on that redistribution of wealth, and then the public authorities have this sum of money that has been generated by the free market, uh, and then they choose to distribute it either well or badly, but without the economy driving forward and being supported, there isn't gonna be any money to distribute, and business just never seems to get that voice across, and I know, you know as a business leader, um, I'm, to, I'm to blame in that. Next one, please, Jonathan. Um, there are sometimes other priorities, and I now look back fondly to Gordon Brown even, uh, when he became Prime Minister. He was obviously famous. I'm sorry this is a bit UK biased, um, but that's me, uh, and you knew you were getting that, David, so hard cheese. Um, Gordon Brown, when he became Prime Minister, he said something different. He said, I'm going to make my priority as Premier solving the housing crisis. This was 2007. And he made the lady on your left, Yvette Cooper, who I put some money on actually to be the uh, next Labour Prime Minister. I think I'm probably going to lose that, but uh, watch, watch out for her. I think she's in the shadows waiting. Um, she was made Housing Minister. So that must have been the most important ministerial job in Britain, because if the priority of the Prime Minister was solving the housing crisis and she was the Housing Minister, uh, that's top job, isn't it? So when I saw her three weeks into her uh, being awarded that job and said congratulations on the most important job in Britain. She looked at me in that very disdainful way, like who the hell are you, you amoeba? Um, and I said, well, you've got the housing ministry you know, and that's the most important uh, uh, job, the prime minister said. And she looked at me again in the, down, down her nose. Uh, two months later, she was promoted to undersecretary for the Treasury. So that's an interesting uh, um, reflection on actually what Gordon Brown thought about how important housing was. Um, next slide, please, Jonathan. Um, but in the UK, we, we cannot have a housing crisis. Uh, in fact, we don't have a housing crisis. Uh, because if we did have a housing crisis, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the COBRA Committee uh, in Britain. It actually stands for Committee Briefing Room A. Uh, but it meets when there's a crisis. Uh, and other than the tragic uh, Grenfell fire um, a few months ago, it's never met to discuss housing. So we can't have a housing crisis because the House Crisis Committee has never met to discuss it. Actually, we don't have a housing crisis. We have a much broader crisis. We have a social care crisis. We have an elderly crisis. And we have particularly a pensions 
crisis. Most people's wealth in the UK, and I'm sure the same in Ireland, is actually tied up in their properties. So if you want to solve the housing crisis, what does solving the housing crisis mean? The afford affordability element of the housing crisis. So are we going to reduce your major asset in your life that is there to pay for your retirement and your elderly care? Ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen just by building more houses and dropping the price of houses. There has to be a much broader approach right the way across society. We need a much more intelligent debate about some of these issues that do need to be addressed as part of solving the housing crisis. Jonathan. For some, for some years I've been, uh, ever since I was a kid actually, I've been, I've been intrigued at uh, the stupidity, as, as I saw it, of certain aspects uh, of life throughout history. Um, and this is a, a red coat soldier, as I'm sure you all know. And, uh, the English soldiers used to wear red, um, apparently because it was, you know, kind of showed bravery and didn't show the blood and you know, it was very smart and stuff like that. But it took, it took hundreds of years for someone to say, actually, you make quite a good target, especially in the bush, if you're wearing red. So you know, it's kind of like reality blindness was a, was a phrase I came up with. Uh, if you go on to the next one, John. Um, in the First World War, I, I don't fly something quite like this, but I do fly uh, a vintage biplane for, um, for, a, for a hobby and fun. Um, the British invented parachutes. Uh, the British pilots in World War I didn't wear parachutes because the powers that be felt that if they were given parachutes, they might kind of give up on a fight and bail out. And the Germans who, you know, kind of saw that we'd invented parachutes, gave all their pilots parachutes, and they fought a lot damn harder. You know, like, what kind of mentality is this kind of, is this, the economist calls it um, strategic ignorance or motivated reasoning. Uh, and we see a lot of this throughout society. You know, these are just a few examples. Um, Jonathan, next one, please. Divisions in society, when do you think women really got the vote in the UK, 1928, just after Emmeline Pankhurst had died, sadly. Uh, women over the age of 30 got the vote in 1919 if they owned property. It's not that long ago. My mother was born in 1928. You know, and a lot of us uh, judge other societies and uh, very much you know, as of today. We don't realize that 1969, there was still racial segregation in the States. My kids pointed that out to me. They said, Dad, did you realize you know, there's racial segregation in 1969 in the United States? You know, the land of the free, the land where us and them doesn't exist. Um, Saudi Arabia just allowed certain women to, to drive. Um, societies move uh, and make judgments as, as to what is right and what is wrong you know, at different paces. And it is very easy for us to to sort of judge other societies. But within ourselves, um, societies are changing very fast. And again, I was just talking, talking to Sheila, and I think some of, the, some of the decisions that you guys have made as a society you know, are really moving this country forward. I'm not, I'm not gonna say for the better. Yes, I am, you know, I think for the better, but um, you know, that's me judging you guys, you know, for voting for, for gay marriage, and goodness knows what's, what's gonna happen on your abortion debate, but at least you're having the debate, at least you're, you're making the decisions and you are, you are moving forward. Next one please, Jonathan. And this is the, uh, the gay pride march um, in the UK. Uh, gay men uh, only had full rights in 2014 across the board, quite extraordinary. Uh, but we are very judgmental uh, of others. Next one please, Jonathan. Divisions in society, well this is the, uh, the poster girl, isn't it, of uh, of the right in America. Uh, I guess it could have been worse. She could have been uh, vice president uh, before. I don't know, really, if that's worse than what they've got at the moment. But um, the latest horrendous mass shooting in the States, uh, of course, a lot of people in the States say no, no, nothing can be done. Nothing can be done about these you know, occasional mass shootings. But these are people saying it in a country where they've got more guns 
than the whole of the population, and that includes women and children as well. 300 million guns. Nothing can be done. Mm. Well, next one, please, John. So, get back to property development, shall we? That's what I'm here for. Actually, you said I could talk about anything I wanted, so I don't have to get back to property development, but I am getting back to property development uh, with this particular uh, image and the next one. Now, this is the... Uh, no, sorry, back to that one. I like this one. My father was in these just, just after the war, actually. Uh, this is the de Havilland Mosquito, and it could fly at uh, 40,000 feet. It could do over 400 miles an hour, uh, and it was the most successful uh, aircraft through every different role uh, in warfare, from, uh, from bombing to uh, low-level attack uh, and fighters and reconnaissance. Um, and most of the pilots who, um, who went out in those and the navigator came back. Um, so if you were going to have to fight and fly, these were the planes to go in. And the bombing version of this could take a thousand pound bomb. Next one, please, Jonathan. So when the Americans um, came into the war and uh, said, we will do the daylight bombing, um, we'll make a bomber. They came up with the B-17, the, the Flying Fortress, which had a crew uh, of nine. And very sadly, uh, most of the pilots and crew that went out in these didn't come back. And the Americans figured that you know, this was so armed with guns facing in every direction, uh, it was going to be able to look after itself. Uh, but it flew half the height of the Mosquito and half the speed in the German fighters, um, sadly. Uh, shot most of them down. This is actually a later version uh, where the survival rate was much better and for those of you who are interested and everyone else that's here because I'm going to tell you anyway um, they did become quite a success uh, when the long-range fighter planes used to go out and escort them. Um, but the reason for showing you those two aeroplanes incidentally this one, the first version of this could only carry a thousand pound bomb load as well, the later ones were better. But you think, well, why didn't the Americans just get mosquitoes? Because, you know, they did all of the jobs better. And the reason they didn't is they wanted to employ lots of Americans on the production lines of Detroit that you know, were sitting idle. Uh, they wanted to bolster the economy you know, and get the American population uh, behind the war effort. Um, and they genuinely thought that you know, this was a good solution to the problem. It was their own solution. It was a very different solution to the mosquito. The mosquito would have been very difficult to mass manufacture you know, and it wasn't designed, it wasn't built in America and sometimes it's very important that the ideas and solutions do come you know, from the particular community. Next one Jonathan please. Now there's many ways of, uh, of creating urban environments and um, I'm sure you all have your, your favourite parts of Limerick, I'm sure you all have your favourite parts of Dublin, I'm sure you have your favourite parts of, of other urban environments around the world. And, uh, developers um, do get the hard time, sometimes deservedly. Um, I think, well, I know, in, in the UK, 96% uh, of the whole of the um, mainland of, of Britain, Scotland and Wales, 96% has been developed. Now, before you think that's complete nonsense, you know, developed for farming, developed for forestry, developed for other reasons, there's only 4% is actually natural uh, as it's always been uh, since the year dot. Um, so developers have a huge uh, role in everything around us, but it's particularly the built environment that quite rightly we all focus in. But some of our favorite places, you know, forget Killarney and the Wicklow Mountains and some of the lovely places we were at this morning in the pouring rain, Jonathan, that I couldn't see, but you told me they were lovely. Um, some of our favourite places are the built environment. So developments can be done well. This happens to be uh, Bloomsbury in London, if you go on to the next one. It happens to be Caracas in Venezuela. Um, well, that's quite a line between the rich and the poor there, isn't it? Between us and them. Uh, there are the poor living in the, um, in the shanty towns, uh, and they thought, well, let's build a big highway dividing them. Um, and back to uh, Bill Clinton's um, it's the economy, stupid. Um, there's very few societies fall apart or get annoyed um, in, in other ways if they are economically successful. 
um, and allowing people the skills, giving people the skills through education and access to employment is really you know, the best way for all of us to, to bind society together a bit more. Next one, please, Jonathan. When you think about how urban environments, the built environments have changed, and maybe Jeremy Corbyn should have a little think about this. Uh, these were individual private inventors, private entrepreneurs that invented the railway uh, and showed that the railway was an interesting tool um, and private companies started to build railways and the Industrial Revolution started to pick up. And the railways changed the way that we built urban settlements and obviously the Industrial Revolution accelerated that. But, but up to the point of the railways, urban settlements tended to be you know, on the mouths of rivers you know, where there were ports, river crossings, like at Limerick, um, valley intersections, you know, possibly on hillsides you know, from, a, from a defensive point of view. But the railways really changed that. They started to allow people to, to plan settlements, you know, railway intersections, you know, man-made uh, intersections, transport intersections. Next one, please, John. But if you think about two individuals that have probably affected the way we experience development more than anything else, uh, these two gentlemen are probably right up there uh, with Mr. Ford and the, and the, uh, the car uh, going to the masses uh, and Mr. Rockefeller putting the uh, petrol filling stations uh, right the way across, across the states. And interestingly, uh, Mrs. Ford drove an electric car uh, and she preferred it. Um, and if they hadn't discovered oil, perhaps there hadn't been someone as... Um, entrepreneurial as uh, Mr. Rockefeller, uh, maybe we would have had electric cars as opposed to um, uh, petrol and diesel cars. But you know, these guys, you know, private sector, entrepreneurs, getting on and doing stuff. And then the government's kind of followed on, oh, we'd better build some highways and stuff like that. Next one, please. Jonathan. So are there big disruptors, big individual disruptors? Um, Larry Page from Google, maybe Elon Musk, possibly um, uh, with his Teslas uh, and his rockets, Jeff Bezos from Amazon. Um, all of these guys you know, are very, uh, very clever. Uh, they're very well financed uh, and they are doing things at the moment uh, that may well influence our built environment, our whole lives in ways that we can't predict. Um, I have some views about autonomous vehicles. I think they will be very helpful in many situations and they're already being used a lot in uh, agriculture. Um, I don't think in urban environments they are, they are the answer because if you think about some of the things that we're told about these autonomous vehicles, they're gonna be able to, to team up and make convoys and drive closer um, so they, going to get more vehicles you know, on, on the roads and when you're not driving you're going to be able to do things like read newspapers but you know, I thought newspapers had kind of been taken over with stuff like the wireless you know, um, you know, you'd be able to have conversations with, um, with other people in the vehicles and maybe if they actually join and link you know you might have doors between the two vehicles and you might be able to actually stand up and walk and you know, meet other people it's actually called the tram or the train or the bus, you know, we are in danger of reinventing public transport that works very well. I know that's a bit, uh, a bit uh, negative anyway, but these, these companies yeah, like YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, I was just, just actually, I was standing outside and there's just been a news flash come in. Um, YouTube, Twitter and Facebook are actually merging. I don't know if any of you picked that up uh, tonight uh, and their new name is you Twitface. Next one, please, Jonathan. <laughs> now, um, urban, urban densities. Um, cities are the future, I don't need to tell you that. Populations are uh, increasingly moving into urban areas, and you know, new urban areas uh, and existing urban areas are going through you know, the biggest expansion ever in our history, uh, as our population is as well. And these just give you some ideas of, of the densities of, of the various cities. But going dense and using public transport as the next uh, image, uh, not the next image, will we'll show, you know, is not always a success. Next one, please, Jonathan. 
Um, this is the area in dark of Atlanta, and uh, on the right, the uh, area of Berlin. Very similar populations, uh, very similar GDPs, but, um, but Atlanta is very much car-based, uh, very much you know, the housing uh, has cars, no public transport. Um, and I leave it to you to, um, to, to uh, come up with which cities will be more successful in the future. Next one, please, Jonathan. But cities with great public transport you know, can still do uh, not very inspiring architecture or not very inspiring places to live. This is Hong Kong, and there's you know, hundreds of examples uh, throughout uh, Asia, you know, throughout South America, throughout the whole world uh, of uh, this kind of density uh, done very badly. I think, you know, go to Manhattan, as uh, I'm sure lots of us have had the privilege to go to. You know, that is density that is generally done done well. Some of Hong Kong is very good. Next one, please. Oh, back to development. Um, David, in his introduction, uh, was very generous uh, in saying that I have been involved in some fairly significant uh, schemes. Uh, developing one building is a real privilege. Uh, I'm sure if any of you have had the, the pleasure to, you know, to produce a building or an extension or a house, you know, it's very satisfying. You know, it's going to be there for quite a while. Uh, it's going to affect you know, not only your lives, but other people's lives. You know, maybe you're building it for someone else. You know, Winston Churchill, as we all know, said, you know, we shape the buildings and then it's the buildings that shape us. You know, it can have quite a big effect, uh, even just an extension. You know, staying with Mr. Harper down there, you know, your extension. You know, what a wonderful place to sit and work and think and discuss and socialise and eat lovely food. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it does change your life, doesn't it? The Minister for Housing in the UK uh, after World War II was also the Minister for Health. Now, there's a thought. So do you think you know, the built environment has an impact on you know, how we live, our health and well-being? Of course it does. So yeah, they knew that then. We had a housing crisis after World War II. We had a big housing crisis. So what did we do? We had a big housing crisis solution we decided to build 12 new towns, brand new towns, 50,000 people in each town. And what that enabled us to do was to acquire land at a low enough price to then enable the development to pay for all of the social elements that goes in it, all of the schools, all of the hospitals, all of the roads, all of the parks, all of the spaces. And one of the problems we're suffering certainly in the UK, certainly in, in Ireland as well, is the control of land release is so constrained by all of us as societies, as politicians, that the price is very high. So you start with a very high entry price and development is getting more and more complicated. I don't expect a violin, but if any of you, you know, have built a house, it's quite tough. You, know, you have to know a little bit about geology, you have to know a little about foundations and building and all those thousands of components coming together. You, you build a complex building, you know, not only are there thousands of components coming together, but now there are literally thousands and thousands of pieces of regulation, you know, probably quite rightly too. It's a very complex process. You, know, you employ very intelligent people, you know, very well-trained people um, to produce these things, but it's very expensive. And if the land is very expensive, you know, it's not surprising we can't do the social infrastructure very well. It's not surprising we don't say, well, let's be generous with the parks, let's be generous with the width of the streets. You know, well, yes, why don't we build a, you know, a women's centre or a youth centre? You know, why not? You know, there's no commercial demand for it, but we know there is a societal demand. Um, so let me go through some of the experiences I've been lucky enough to have, moving more from um, a privilege of doing one building to perhaps more of a responsibility uh, of building whole new pieces of city. Um, and that responsibility uh, was shared, and that responsibility was quite rightly shared. You know, we are not elected members of these cities. Next one, please, Jonathan. Uh, you know, what, what is our role you know, in shaping you know, the new centre of Birmingham? Um, and I will go on to explain that. This is the Bullring, the previous Bullring shopping centre in the second centre of Birmingham now been demolished and replaced by the, by the new building. New building. 
Now, Birmingham had grand plans, plans as many cities did in the 60s. Motor City, it was called, you know, big inner ring road, eight lane inner ring road, uh, segregated pedestrian routes, you know, huge covered shopping centres. Next one, please, Jonathan. But by the 70s, uh, Birmingham's economy, based on the manufacturing sector, uh, was not doing very well, to put it mildly. Uh, this is just one example. They never worked out that the Mini, as successful as it was, actually never made any money. Because when they actually put all of the development costs and the factory costs and the staff costs into what the real cost of the Mini should be, they were under-pricing it for the whole of its life. It came out of the factories right up to the mid-70s. So it wasn't surprising uh, when British Leyland, if some of you remember, started to get into serious problems. Next one, please, Jonathan. So things were bad in Birmingham. You know, unemployment was very high. Um, and what happened in the late 80s, as it says there, things were bad, and it was generally recognised that they couldn't really get any worse. And there was a huge political consensus. There was a huge coming together of interest groups, you know, from civic trust organisations, from heritage organisations, from university academic institutions, and just members of the public. They got captured by, what are we going to do with our city, the city that we love, the city that's got so much heritage and history and so many good things about it, but it's falling apart. <coughs> it's falling apart. And they went away. Um, anyone could go, but they went away. They had a very good chairperson, uh, and they produced uh, the Highbury Initiative report um, and at, at the time Birmingham had a very good political leader uh, Roger Knowles uh, they then went on to have another very good leader Sir Albert Bohr uh, and they subsequently have had very good leaders now I'm not quite sure whether they were just lucky with good leaders or the leaders were lucky that they actually had this strong vision that had a very broad backing and endorsement from the electorate and the population and I think it's a bit of both I think you, know, you don't have to always wait you know, for a good leader. I think most people in this room could be good leaders you know, if you know, there is a strong vision that's been brought together properly. Um, they were also helped because they applied and got £300 million of European uh, grant, which, next one, Jonathan, which as part of this strategy, uh, these are the inner ring roads and the outer ring roads that they had in Motor City and they decided to, to reduce um, the importance of road traffic uh, and literally punch through these inner ring roads with pedestrian routes, with new connections. Um, and they came up with this strategy to have five quarters, which um, I always thought was quite, uh, quite funny. Uh, next one, please, Jonathan. Um, and they embarked on the largest pedestrianisation programme in Europe. I'm not saying pedestrianisation is always the right way to go. Some pedestrian streets you know, are, very, uh, are very bad, very unsuccessful, uh, not nice places at all. Uh, sometimes traffic you know, at the right speeds with the right pavement width you know, is, is a good thing for streets. But in Birmingham's situation, uh, they pedestrianised New Street. Next one, please, Jonathan. Uh, and they created, they expanded um, Victoria Square. This was the first kind of new public square you know, that any city had done you know, for hundreds of years since these great big civic spaces uh, were produced. Next one, please, Jonathan. Um, and with the European money from Jacques Delors, they've still got a, a, a plaque on the wall saying, thank you, Jacques Delors. Can't be many places that uh, would say, thank you, Jacques Delors. Maybe some of you guys got some money from the EU to do good stuff. But they built the uh, International Convention Centre, uh, which was the only one in the UK at the time capable of holding the G7 summit, which is why Bill Clinton uh, was, at, was at Birmingham. Next one, please, Jonathan. Um, and what was, what was our role up there? Well, we kind of came on the, their coattails. You know, they had spent 300 million. They had come up with this vision. Um, and on the, on the far right, I don't know if you can just see that kind of black line going through the the white convention centre. They'd created this route, they'd made connections. You know, cities are about one thing, they're about connections. People like journeying, people like going where people are, people are explorers, people are inquisitive. And if you create a safe environment for people to journey, 
Uh, and along that environment, you create things that they might find of interest, whether it's culture or whether it's just a cup of coffee or whether it's other people or whether it's somewhere where you can sit and watch the world go by. People will start to use these connections and cities will start to come to life again. So we had this um, 17 acres, we used to call it um, 17 acres of industrial wasteland, about 10 minutes too far uh, of the city centre to the west. It wasn't our... Um, it wasn't our marketing slogan we used everywhere, but it was something we reminded ourselves uh, how much challenge we had. Um, and you can see on the, uh, the right-hand image, I hope, you can see what looks like a new public space in the middle of an industrial wasteland. That's because it is a new public space in the middle of an industrial wasteland. Uh, and our offices were in a new building just on the corner. And we used to watch dozens, not hundreds, but dozens of people walking past our offices and they used to stand in the middle of that new public space and scratch their heads metaphorically and sometimes physically uh, and wonder where they were and why they were there and what they were doing. So we thought what a great opportunity to build a cafe uh, and then they'd be able to sit down and uh, spend money uh, and we'll have that money, thank you very much. Um, and we were amazed. These were people who were young enough to still be at work. And, you know, why weren't they? These were people who had kids. You know, why weren't the kids at school? We were fascinated by where all these people were coming from. And to this day, I don't really know where they were coming from, but they were coming. And they seemed, you know, nice people. Uh, next one, please, Jonathan. Um, so back to that Mosquito and B17. When we acquired this site, other developers had looked at ways of delivering it and I don't expect you to see the, the master plan frameworks of the streets and the, and the building blocks uh, on the left. Um, and it doesn't look as though we change much uh, with our streets and public spaces and building blocks to the right, but we did, uh, because we found that the ones to the left, you couldn't implement it in uh, financially viable phases. You had to put too much infrastructure in. You had to build a big basement car park. Uh, and a successful master plan has to be deliverable you know, in economically viable phases. And you have to be able to stop when the next downturn comes, because the next downturn will come. Uh, and the you know, reason a lot of developers go bust is because you spend a lot of money, it takes a long time, you know, and the downturn comes every seven to nine years. You know, whatever we say, it's going to come. And when they come, they come very fast, uh, and no one knows when the next one's going to come, but you know it's going to come. So you've got to be ready. And if you spent too much money and you haven't got any money back, you're going to go bust. And developers, you know, the last 200 years, if you look at quoted sector of developers, uh, they have had more casualties than any other area of business because it's very capital intensive and it's very long term. Um, so you've got to try and structure the delivery in a way that can withstand a pause or can withstand uh, longer than a pause. Next one, please, Jonathan. Um, so building places that people want to socialise, they want to eat, they want to drink. Um, it's now become ubiquitous you know, in, in kind of all of our urban areas, um, places to sit and go outside. Next one, please, John. And this was the public space we created uh, in Brindley Place. <coughs> and I say public, it is owned uh, by the private sector, but it is absolutely public. And I know there's a big debate about that. Maybe we'll cover it uh, in, in questions. Um, but some of the most interesting conversations <clears throat> I've heard, and actually um, there was a chap interviewed uh, on Central TV, as then was, uh, standing in that square looking at that building <clears throat> on, on the left, the, the kind of Venetian one. And the, and the interviewer said, you know, what do you think about you know, Brindley Place? Uh, and I won't do the accent because I'm not very good at it. He, he said, you know, I, I think it's great. You know, it's lovely. You know, I bring my family here. You know, I bring all my friends here, all the visitors that come up to Birmingham. You know, and, and I show them you know, my new Birmingham. You know, this, is, this, is a, this is a wonderful, wonderful place, um, which I thought was nice. You know, it's his Birmingham. It's not ours. It's his. Yeah. And um, the interviewer said, what do you think about the architecture? Um, and I will do the accent now. He says, oh, I don't know. I've never noticed. Um, you know, most people don't notice the architecture. What he did notice was it was a nice place to be. It was a nice square. He could walk there. He could get there. You know, I don't know if I ask you guys, you know, 
I walked you down some of the streets in Limerick and I suddenly you know, put a big sombrero on you and said, what's, what, what's the architecture like on this street? You know, I bet you know, very few people look up above the shop front. There's probably some fantastic architecture, particularly down at Oxford Street in, uh, in London. You do that with people. You know, it's an amazing architecture. Sometimes it goes completely to waste because you know, if the street, if street width is good, if you feel it's good, if you've got seats and you've got trees, you've got nice ground floor uses. You know, very few people look up. Um, but when he was pressed further, he said, I really like the old building, which of course had just been finished, but it you know, happened to be in that old style. Um, and one of the reasons we did that particular form of architecture is if you think about most of the historic civic spaces we know, you know they tended to have a major public building at the end of them, a town hall or a museum or something. Um, and obviously, you, know, you don't get that kind of stuff anymore, so we thought we'd do one that sort of gave it a hierarchy. Next one, please, John. Um, and we also did some, uh, what we regarded at the time as, as fairly crazy things. We put uh, restaurants under offices, uh, and in, uh, in the 1990s, no one was building a new office building with a restaurant underneath, maybe. Uh, no one put housing on top of offices. You know, I'm not saying you should do that all over the place, because there are uh, challenges and issues, but um, but other places in the world do it very successfully. And getting that urban intensity in, into urban areas, getting the mix of uses, getting the 18 hour a day, people coming to work, you know, people coming to live, people coming out in the evening, I think is, uh, is very important to, um, to get the best out of um, our urban areas. Next one, please. Come on. And I know this doesn't look uh, particularly uh, lovely housing or particularly high density, but this we are told, and this is at Brindley Place, uh, this was the first uh, private housing uh, for decades uh, in an inner city part of, uh, part of the UK. And this scheme, which we did with Barclay Homes in partnership, uh, they tell us that it was this scheme that demonstrated that people did want to live in cities again. People didn't necessarily need a car, you know, they wanted to walk to work. You know, they wanted to experience the life of the city. Uh, and this scheme then went on, certainly for, for Barclays and many other developers, you know, to kickstart the, um, the kind of urban living revolution that many cities have experienced. Next one, please, Jonathan. But it's not just about our 17 acres. Obviously, the city centre had, um, had undertaken this, this major strategy of, of reconnecting the city and making it uh, an environment that people wanted to to journey through and spend time. Um, getting together the other occupiers, getting together the other property owners, um, and working together on a stronger vision, business improvement districts. You know, we stole the idea from the States, I don't know if you have them over here. But getting people to realize that by working together and, and making little improvements you know, can make a huge difference to the quality of their properties and, and investments. So this is the business improvement district in Birmingham that, uh, in the vote got uh, a 98.5% turnout uh, and a 99% acceptance of, uh, of forming it. Um, now Birmingham was doing very well in the uh, 90s um, uh, and some cities were um, starting to get a little bit interested, stroke jealous, but it was quite difficult to build a consensus to do stuff because if cities aren't that bad, people kind of just say, just leave us alone, it's okay, my life's okay, it's not that bad. Next slide please. Then Manchester had this, 1996. Uh, unfortunately, no one, no one was killed, extraordinarily. Uh, but this was the catalyst. This was what made Manchester come together politically. And this is what made Manchester form a vision. Next one, please, Jonathan. And they did a very similar thing to, uh, to, to Birmingham. They started to reconnect the city, pedestrianise where it was appropriate. Um, and more important, and you know, one leap ahead of Birmingham, uh, they started to invest big time in public transport, the tram system, you know, getting people from the poorer areas around the city. It was a much more holistic strategy. This was connecting you know, the sink estates, you know, Hume and places like that, you know, where worklessness you know, was three generations, where unemployment was 55% you know, of some of the populations in some of the areas. You, know, you could walk to the city centre, but people weren't doing it. People didn't know what work was. There was no one living around them that had a job. So there was no, no kind of help. So a huge, you know, 
um, series of, of policy initiatives, you know, to, to mix up the residential, you know, to make it more connected, uh, to help on the education, to get business mentors in there. Next one, please, Jonathan. Um, and improving the, the public spaces, the public space on, on the left, Piccadilly Gardens, very successful uh, in the 20s and 30s, but a bit down at heel. Uh, and the company I used to run was, was very pleased to work very much in partnership uh, with Manchester City Centre. Again, great leadership in Manchester with um, Richard Lees, the political leader, and uh, Sir Howard Bernstein, some of you, some of you may know. Uh, great characters, were they great leaders or was it just you know, the fact that the city came together and wanted, wanted to do it? Next one, please, John. Um, again, getting together interested parties you know, uh, to, to think what could be done to the public space, to public transport, to their shop fronts, uh, to the marketing, you know, to, to the whole images, to the mixes of uses. Um, this wasn't a formal business improvement district, but it was a, a partnership of, of the willing to, um, to yes, put some money in, uh, match funded by the, uh, by the city, but improve that, uh, that whole area. And starting to realize that, um, that actually having 65,000 students in and around Manchester was actually its greatest draw. You know, the future you know, of economies, the future of businesses you know, was, was on the doorstep. Uh, and starting to work with the universities and connect to the universities and celebrate uh, young people uh, and how you know, they weren't just all the drunken you know, kind of layabouts that we might have been at university. Um, Manchester also benefited from having a decent international airport and the city invested heavily in that as well. Um, next one please John. Slightly different experience uh, in Reading and I know Limerick has the 2030 plan. Um, I've got to say I haven't, I, I haven't read it, I will, I'd love to see a copy. Um, I promised I won't swear, but this, this was uh, Reading's 2020 plan. It was crap. Um, it wasn't supported by the population. Uh, there was no consultation. You know, it was frou-frou. It was a marketing document. It was flimsy. There was no depth. Um, next one, please, Jonathan. My company was the biggest developer in, in and around Reading. We uh, built a lot of business park buildings. This is where the computer companies of the, uh, of the 90s wanted to go. They wanted to go into these parkland settings, you know, into these sealed boxes, you know, stuff full of air conditioning. You know, opening a window and you know, experiencing you know, nature you know, was not something they wanted to do. You know, they all drove there. Um, I think the world is changing uh, dramatically, certainly our experience uh, from, from London and other urban areas. And Reading, in fairness, did see that uh, you know, the city centre you know, should be making a comeback. Next one, please, John. Um, and if I said to you, name that city, you know, the city with a, a huge you know, river frontage running right through it, you know, a city with another major river running through it, a, a, a city with a, uh, you know, one of the top you know, 20 universities, Red Brick universities in the UK, the city that you know, used to have uh, the King of England you know, and the Parliament based in it, uh, the city with the 10th you know, most successful, largest shopping centre, you, know, you wouldn't instantly think of Reading because actually Reading doesn't punch its weight, let alone punch above its weight. And next one, please, Jonathan. And our experience of trying to work with them in, in the city centre is things weren't bad enough. They were kind of too comfortable. Um, and when we were encouraged to, to do that scheme on the right, to build residential, you know, higher density residential and new public spaces uh, in the centre of, of Reading. Um, my uh, female colleague who was, who was running the, the Reading office for me, I, I went to a planning meeting uh, and one of the councillors went, uh, went up to my female colleague and right up to her face said, you are development scum. You know, get out of my town. And, you know, I, I, I had to respond you know, by saying, excuse me, you, know, you can call me that if you want, but please don't say that you know, to my colleague. I'm the chief executive. Um, so we got out of that town, because I'm not saying we want a red carpet, you know, we want people to say, you know, come on down, you know, just do whatever you want to do. But you know, we do want people who say, how can we help? Um, and certainly, you know, I've found that in Manchester uh, and Birmingham, 
um, hugely, you know, and, and you know, in fairness to certain parts of London. Um, you know, developers can't develop anything without help, serious help, you know, without political help, uh, without the help from you know, the communities and, and the planners. Um, you know, when you get a situation like that, you know, we kind of vote with our feet. You know, we've got a choice you know, where we invest our money, and I'm not investing in Reading anymore. All I do in Reading now is actually fly my aeroplane upside down over it and give them one finger. <laughs> Next one, please. <clears throat> Next one, gentlemen. Um, I do, you know, were we lucky uh, as a company to, um, to be selected for this opportunity in, in King's Cross? Um, there are some lessons, you know, from this, I think, for, um, for Limerick and, and other places, but... You know, what a unique opportunity between those two stations, St Pancras and, and King's Cross. Um, 56 acres you know, of former railway lands, uh, distribution and storage lands, uh, that had been uh, semi-derelict, uh, or certainly very down at heel, um, certainly a no-go area you know, for decades. Uh, and I don't need to tell you guys, you know, King's Cross uh, had an international reputation for, for being the uh, down at heel, uh, dangerous, dirty, you know, prostitutes, drugs, etc. Um, but it also happened to have those two amazing stations, which again were a, a bit down at heel. Also has six London Underground lines uh, converging underneath. You know, that is the best connected public transport interchange in Europe. Um, so we figured that was probably quite a good place. To, to build stuff that, um, that could benefit from that public transport. Um, next one, please, John. Um, the site also had 20 historic buildings, um, such as this amazing granary where the grain used to come in from, from Lincolnshire on the train and then the uh, canal narrowboats literally used to go under the building and then the horses and carts used to come in uh, the sides. You know, this was an intermodal transport interchange, multi-level transport interchange. You know, this is when the this, Victorians knew how to do this kind of stuff. You know. Show me another you know, multimodal transport interchange. I don't think there is one, but there uh, probably is. Amazon are probably doing one, aren't they? Um, but you know, keeping these buildings, bringing these buildings you know, back to life, you know, what an absolute unique way to create you know, an identity that you know, wouldn't make our new development at King's Cross just somewhere else that could be in Milan or could be in Birmingham, dare I say, you know, could be anywhere, you know. This is unique. Next one, please, Jonathan. Uh, and these were pretty unique. Uh, many structural uh, engineers here. Um, these are the world's only uh, gas holder triplets. Um, so you can see how, how high they are. Um, and because they were so high, and because they were made of cast and wrought iron, they were very brittle, you know, not much tensile strength in, in those materials. So they, so they intersected them like Venn diagrams uh, to give them the, um, the, the strength. Um, and the reason they're, they're unique is because just when they were finished, some bugger invented steel. Uh, and of course, steel you know, had the tensile strength and so gas holders after this became the, the steel that you know all over the place. Um, so these were grade two listed um, but they had to be moved to, to make way for the um, uh, high speed rail coming into the north of St Pancras. Um, and I got a clue as to how important they were because at a cocktail um, evening the chairman of English Heritage was chatting to uh, an architect I knew um, and um, he didn't know who I was at the time. Um, but I just overheard him saying those gas holder triplets at King's Cross are the most important heritage structure in Britain and it's very important that you know, the developer, you know, whoever you know, he is, it was always a he then, the developer, you know, bloody tries hard to keep them. So I thought that was a clue. So, um, so we kept them. We got on very well with English heritage after that, but we would have done it anyway because they were wonderful people. Next one, please, gentlemen. Um, King's Cross um, had a kind of design history of various attempts at, um, at coming up with new ideas for streets and squares and a new urban uh, quarter um, almost two decades before us. These are um, from the mid-90s and mid-90s, mid-80s and 
uh, late 1980s. Um, and the developer was chosen by British Rail Properties, and then I won't bore you fully, but they decided that they couldn't afford, the government decided they couldn't afford the Channel Tunnel Rail Link coming under uh, central London from the south, and the whole thing got, got scrapped. Um, but interesting uh, what some of those um, world class, certainly world known architects were coming up with. The one on the right is um, a Sir Norman Foster proposal of creating a huge park uh, in the middle. Um, all of the schemes built over the railway lines coming out of uh, St Pancras uh, and, and King's Cross. Uh, but most of them got rid of most of the old buildings, which is quite interesting. Um, next one, please, John. Um, they got a lot of local opposition. Um, Camden in the 70s, I don't know, which is the London borough where um, King's Cross is, uh, was a little bit um, politically um, active. There was uh, big rent uh, control riots in the 1970s. And um, certainly um, we were very aware of, of the history of opposition to, um, to those previous development proposals. Uh, and there was a sort of view that if you had a job, you were a class enemy kind of thing. You, know, you kind of felt that a bit. Um, and certainly, you know, there was a view prevailing in some groups, you know, this was long before Twitter, um, where you know, private ownership of land was definitely theft. And I sort of, I do have a bit of sympathy on that. You know, there's no such thing as really private ownership, is there? You're just a custodian for a bit. You know, that's my, my view of land. Uh, sometimes you do need to own it and finance off it and stuff like that. Um, but we were very concerned um, about the potential kind of ferocity opposition to, um, to our development proposal coming forward. Um, and we, we went away with um, groups of um, academics, uh, uh, development um, specialists, uh, archaeologists, historians, uh, urban designers, you know, other architects, landscape people. Um, um, they were all invited, but you know, it was a pretty broad mix of people. And we went away for three days and we ran a series of lectures going, you know, what would you do you know, if you had 56 acres of this part of London? You know, what would you consider uh, would be a good, good result? And we came up with, um, with these principles. It happens to be 10. It always seems to be 10, doesn't it? We ought to come up with 11 or 9 one day, but we came up with 10. Um, and we produced this, this document and we showed it to the leader of Camden, uh, Dane Jane Roberts, um, and we showed it to the head of English Heritage. And we said, you know, we've produced this document and, you know, love your, your comments. Um, and we were completely bowled over. They said, it's absolutely brilliant and we're going to endorse it. So our first piece of, you know, we're, we're the developers here, this is our vision, was endorsed by you know, the political entity, you know, and English heritage, you had so much. Um, we still got lots of concern and lots of opposition, if you go on to the, to the next image. Um, what, we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to engage as many people as possible, but we wanted the engagement to be as well informed as possible. Uh, and we wanted to, to make sure that, uh, that misinformation um, could be tackled with the fact that we had got the right information uh, out in the in the public domain, and I know there's a lot of um, hate uh, in the in the world uh, at the moment. Um, there always has been, I guess. You know. If you could remove any one word from the English language and all the connotations that go with it, and you could wave a magic wand, you'd, you'd certainly get rid of hate, wouldn't you? And suddenly, you know, things would be better—not perfect, but, but but better. So, I hate it when people use the word hate. Um, too much, but I hate three things. Uh, I hate insincerity. Uh, I hate the misuse of information you know, for a particular agenda, uh, and we're seeing a lot of that at the moment, too much of it at the moment, especially with Twitter and what's now called fake news. And you've got to counter that. You've got to counter it with the facts. You've got to get the facts out fast. You've got to engage more people in the debate. You've got to you know, deal with that misinformation that's coming out. It used to be called propaganda, didn't it, in World War II. Um, and I hate mediocrity. And most of the people I work with, I have the privilege of working with most of the people I meet in my life. You know, they, they're pretty hard-working people. Most of them, you know, spent time at 
colleges or universities or you know, on the tools. You know, they've got trade, they've got, they've got skills, they've got passion. Um, and I don't know anyone that wants to get up in the morning and just do something mediocre. You know, my job you know, as someone who's choreographing all of these different skills and all these different people is, is to allow these people you know, to do a good job, not to do mediocrity. You know. Do you want to get up in the morning and go, I did a really mediocre, mediocre job today? You don't. You, know, you, want to, you want to get satisfaction from, uh, from all of those skills, all of, all of your hard work. Next one, please, Jonathan. Um, <clears throat> engaging with the community at King's Cross actually became a joy, most of it. I saw 7,153 people. We kept a record because, you know, you have to tell people, you know, I went out and see these people. Some of them I saw on a repeated basis. So it wasn't, you know, in fairness, it wasn't all individuals. I met some fantastic people. You know, I got cakes baked for me by the Welsh Tabernacle Church. No cakes here yet, David. Later, I mean. Um, met some very... And do you know what? Some of them had some really good ideas. Some of them were very qualified, bright people who said, how about this, what about this, what about that? And what meeting all those people did is it diffused a lot of fright, a lot of fear. You know, most people are actually, you know, except change is the only constant, you know, everything changes all the time, but people have a, a concern about change. They want to know about change. You know, most of the time they go, yeah, yeah that's fine. You know, thanks for the information. You know, yeah, I'll go with that or you know, I've got these, these concerns. Now, for the first four years of, of King's Cross, there was no policy, there was no local policy, there wasn't a mayor of London, the mayor was coming in, all those policies were being written, uh, and we informed, you know, as part of a lot of people, um, what our views were, how those policies should be written. So it took four years for those policies to, um, to be in place. So there was really no point us putting a planning application in before those policies were in place because you know, our planning application would have been judged on the policies and if there weren't any it would be regarded as premature. I don't think we were idle for, for one day of those four years there. You know, we, we listened, we learned, you know, we tested. Next one please, John. <clears throat> and we learned you know, about the heritage and the, uh, and the amazing uh, history not just of the land we had but the surrounding communities and what was good and what people felt was good uh, are not so good. Um, so talking about intermodal transport interchange, you know, this was just extraordinary where wheat from uh, uh, the great prairies of Lincolnshire, not that they're great prairies really, but you know what I mean, and then coal from, uh, from Yorkshire into uh, the big coal drops, uh, coal from uh, Nottingham into St Pancras where the British Library is, fish from Grimsby um, and Scotland potatoes from East Anglia, milk and cheese from Hertfordshire. You know, that's a proper transport interchange, isn't it? Next one, John. <clears throat> um, so after four years and spending you know, quite a lot of money, uh, we came up with the bleeding obvious. You know, so on the left of the two stations, that's where 95% of the people arrive. Uh, most of the site you know, is around the canal, which runs through it, so it'd be quite handy to get all of those people into the middle of your site. So you build a street, um, and then you want people to go through the street. Um, so, don't know why it took so long, really. Sometimes the obvious you know, takes a long time, doesn't it? But uh, next one, please, John. Um, and then around these routes, you have development areas. You, know, you walk around Limerick, walk around any town, you know, and you've got the main streets, you've got secondary streets, you've got development blocks, you've got development areas. So, building up the narrative as to how we were going to create these 20 new streets and 10 new public spaces in, in London. Um, we got a lot of interest uh, and then progressively a lot of support. Next one, please, John. Um, and what we used, we didn't say, oh, here's San Francisco or here's Manhattan or here's Hong Kong. You know, kind of meaningless, isn't it? You know, how about here's a place in London that you probably know. Uh, you can compare it, you can stand in the streets, you, know, you can sit outside the cafe. You, know, you can walk through the streets. You know, do you like that? Is it too high? Is it too, you know, too shady? Um, and we gave people the facts. So when we started to, to produce our scheme, you know, there was something to counteract the, you know, the misinformation that we knew would come from an increasingly small number of opponents. <coughs> and these small number of opponents were, were very well educated and resourced, um, and they didn't just fight us. You know, they had 
what's become known as uh, compulsive objection disorder syndrome. Um, so they were the people who were leading the objections here in the 80s and they were still around and you know, they objected to Camden's policies coming forward, they objected to the mayor's policies coming forward, they objected to us coming forward, you know, and they were always there looking for a little chink you know, to, to challenge. Next one, please, Jonathan. Um, and what do you do in a new piece of land in a city centre? Well, how about creating a new piece of city centre? And what uses are in city centres? Uh, places where people come and go every day for commerce, you know, offices, we used to call them offices then, I'll come back to that later. Uh, places where people work, they, but these are the people that are going to benefit most from the, um, from the public transport. But homes, you know, always a shortage of homes. And um, The leader of Camden, very early days, said to me, Roger, you know, of course this is a, a new piece of central London and you, know, you should incorporate central London uses in it. Um, but she said, you've got to remember that you know, housing is the top of the agenda of this council. She said, sometimes you know, I come into the council offices and I literally walk over homeless people on the doorsteps of Camden Town Hall. She said, we have 15,000 people on Camden housing waiting list. And I said, Jane, if we built 15,000 homes tomorrow, bang, how long would it be before you had 15,000 more people on your waiting list? And she looked at me and she went, about three months. And that kind of was the breakthrough. You know, successful cities are always going to attract people. Um, and you know, we should have this debate as well. You know, why are we trying to you know, build in some parts of cities you know, so much housing to try and solve every housing problem? It's back to that. You know, we've got a crisis, you know, let's come up with some big solutions, you know, not just mess around at the edge. Next one, please, John. Um, back to the Mosquito and the B-17 again. I have to justify showing you those. Then. Uh, here's Master Plan 24, I think it was, at King's Cross before we suddenly went, well, that seems about right. You know, we've kept most of the heritage buildings. Uh, the development areas seem to work technically. Um, we've got some you know, good public spaces. Next one, please, John. Um, but the policy, and um, as uh, Ronald Reagan said, the most scary nine words in the English language are, I am from the government and here to help. Um, we're not going to get away from uh, governments, local governments, uh, needing to guide, uh, guide us. You know, this is a debate you know, that Jeremy Corbyn's having in the UK, you know, how much uh, guidance or interference or control you know, should should the state have, um, and of course it should have some, yeah, uh, and, and that's a very worthy debate. <clears throat> but I think we did have just a little bit too much, you know, with the mayor wanting to do one, and then the neighbouring borough wanting to do one, and then English Heritage wanting to do one. Next one, please. Jonathan. But sometimes you just have to kind of go along with it. Don't you? Uh, we produced this image uh, in 2004 of what. Uh, the public space, could, the main public space at King's Cross could, uh, could look like. Next one, please, Jonathan. Um, and that, in effect, was the planning application uh, for King's Cross. Uh, it cost us um, 25 million and took six years to get there. Um, but we said, that's the public spaces uh, and the white bits are the development areas. Uh, can we have planning permission, please? 42 supporting documents. Uh, which were taller than my wife when you stack them on top of each other. Uh, but, you know, that's the civilised, you know, mature, questioning, collaborative society here we live in. And, you know, I'm quite pleased with that. You know, let's, let's, let's work with it. It's a little bit um, interfering sometimes. Next one, John. <coughs> and what are the uses going to be in these buildings? Back to that issue, you know, what are cities, you know, what are successful cities about? You know, the difference of uses, different times of day. You know, mixed use is a ground floor experience. You, know, you can have people living above some mixed uses, not always noisy bars and restaurants, but you can certainly have offices above uh, bars and restaurants. You can have cultural attractions, you can have community facilities. So we did a lot of thinking about you know, what these streets, what these spaces were going to be like 18 hours a day. Next one, please, gentlemen. Um, transport at King's Cross, I mentioned the Channel Tunnel Rail Link. Um, decision was made by a blurting John Prescott, if any of you remember John Prescott, Deputy Prime Minister, 
he, he hadn't been told that um, you had to talk to um, other ministries such as the Treasury or Department of Transport before you said things to, um, to particularly our foreign colleagues at, um, at EU meetings. Um, and this is, I am told, a, a true story. Um, he was with the French, who, um, I quote, were taking the piss out of Britain for um, constantly delaying the decision to deliver the high-speed railway. Uh, and John Prescott said, no, that's not true. You know, we have decided to deliver the high-speed railway into central London. And, of course, we hadn't. Um, we hadn't got any money for it. But anyway, that decision was then made and um, we had to work out how to finance it. I'll come on to that in a second. But very complicated uh, transport. This is just the underground. The dark blue is the underground. Tragic fire there in uh, 1987 killed 35 people. Um, and uh, big improvements. But also massive expansion to deal with the uh, high-speed railway coming in. Next one, please, John. Um, there's Mr. Brown as um, treasurer, as he was, and that is Kylie Minogue. Um, and um, in 2004, um, a parliamentary select committee worked out that um, to finance the Channel Tunnel railing, as John Prescott um, you know, had said, we had to deliver it. It was actually being financed with um, government-backed debt uh, and government-backed bonds. So it went on the public sector borrowing requirement. Back, John. And, uh, and Gordon got a little bit upset because he was the prudent chancellor who would only ever you know, borrow you know, uh, in accordance with his golden rules. And he was found out, so he got very annoyed. So he stopped all the transport at King's Cross, literally stopped other than the Channel Tunnel Railway. There was a hole in the ground, the diggers went, the contractors went off site. Not good, not good for us. Um, as Kylie Minogue said, you know, we should be so lucky. What happened next then, Jonathan? 2005, next slide. We won the Olympics. Gordon went mad again. We weren't meant to win the Olympics. Uh, and in the Olympic bid, not that the government ever scrutinised what uh, the Mayor of London and various unscrupulous parties put in the bid, but we said King's Cross Transport Interchange was all going to be finished because it wasn't part of the Olympic bid, but you know, obviously it was all happening, wasn't it? So without the Olympics, certainly, next slide, Jonathan, uh, you wouldn't have King's Cross Station. Uh, you would have had St Pancras because they couldn't stop that because you know, that was, would have been international embarrassment. But you wouldn't have had the Thameslink station underneath because he cancelled that. You wouldn't have had the underground. And I don't think you, know, you would have had our development. Next one, John. Um, so things were going well until 2008. Uh, and then Kylie came up again and said, we could be so lucky. Next one. Because Central St Martins, you know, one of the world's top art and design schools, who we'd been talking to since 2002. Uh, we had agreed a deal with them, we'd designed a, a school. Big debate about uh, what it would do to a new piece of city, incorporating 5,018 to 23 year old drug taking layabouts you know, in the heart of your commercial area. Um, and uh, we thought it'd be quite a good thing, really. Uh, but there was quite a big debate uh, about it. You know, what, what other use could you have there? Um, anyway, the reason we were very lucky with them was because in October the 28th, 2008, you, know, you guys were in the same position as us. Uh, that was pretty grim. It got a bit grimmer, didn't it, in November, I think, that uh, uh, Lehman's had gone. Things were looking very bad. Uh, King's Cross was looking as though it wasn't going to happen. Um, and Central St. Martin's University of the Arts, they got a phone call from Lloyds Bank saying, oh, you know, could we give you another 35 million, you know, so you could, you know, press the button at King's Cross? And that extra 35 million to the 100 million they had, 135 million, we pressed ahead with the university in the first phase. And the money we had, because uh, we were financed by British Telecom Pension Scheme, we just put the infrastructure in, just enough infrastructure to accommodate. Next one, please, John. Um, and these guys agreed to move in without any commitment from us to build any public realm at all. We just committed to do a two metre wide strip of tarmac from their new building to the road. I can't think of many occupiers that you know, would have been happy with that. And they just took the view that when we got the money, we'd do the rest of the scheme. No legal agreement, just a handshake. What luck we had there. Next one, gentlemen. We did get some money, 2012. You know, London started to pick up a bit. 
and we built that public space in front. Uh, still nothing else built, starting to uh, do some building at the, at the north there next one. Uh, and this was 2012. Uh, this was the opening of Granary Square. Um, complete construction site around it. The university was the, was the only building finished. Next one, please, John. Uh, subsequent to that, we built some other public spaces. One of the great um, fun things about being a developer, you can see interesting things and think, oh, I want to do one of those, or something like that. And, in 2000, uh, my wife and I had taken our young son up to Chatsworth House, if any of you have been, been up there in Derbyshire. Bryn has got this lovely stepped you know, water feature. It's also got the best adventure kids playground, if any of you like that kind of thing. Um, so we've got Chatsworth House water feature there. Uh, I've got the postcard, that was the brief to the landscape designer, we have one of those. Uh, and we've got one, next one, John. Um, but putting the public spaces in first, Go back to that earlier slide of Brindley Place where we had the public space, people was, were starting to use it, developments hadn't even started around it. Here's King's Cross uh, from three years ago um, with the new park. Yeah, they're not that expensive to do these parks, you know, but do them well. You know. If you've only got enough money, just do a bit really well. You know, don't kind of spread it out and, and make, it, make it mediocre. Next one, John. Uh, and how you choreograph and how you use and how you get the community to start coming into these public spaces very, very important um, for us. Um, and uh, in, I think it was about 2003, uh, I was talking to one of the um, residents associations near, near King's Cross and I was saying, you know, how Granary Square, which was the big one with the fountains, I said, you know, we're going to get 15,000 people an hour coming here and you know, people from all over London are going to come up and you know, enjoy this you know, public space uh, and they spill out along the canals. And, and this woman, um, she just went off on one. I think that is probably a good description. And she said some very, um, very fruity words um, suggesting that um, uh, I was saying horrible things because um, she said, you ought to come... Uh, outside my flat you know, on any night of the week and see people shooting themselves up uh, and seeing people you know, generally not being very pleasant. And she said, if you think you're going to get another 15,000 of those kind of people outside my front door, I'm going to fight you all the way. And she associated directly you know, more people with more crime. And it is an issue you know, right the way through uh, development. We're finding it a little bit at Canada Water where to say to people, open up a place, get people to, to walk through, to enjoy you know, the spaces and the routes for bona fide reasons. They're going to be safer places, they're going to be better places. Uh, and in fact, that woman emailed me, end of 2012, you know, that picture, and she said, dear Mr. Madeline, you know, I was the lady that stood up and you know, gave you a hard time. She said, I'd just like to say thank you. I've just been in Granary Square with my grandchildren and she said, it's wonderful, you know, and you've made us feel very welcome. And that, so, wish I'd kept the email, really, but I don't know how to save emails, Jonathan. Next one, please. Um, gas holders. Sorry? Gas holders. Those are the gas holders, yes. Uh, that's the, the new scheme. Uh, there are a few apartments for sale there still. Uh, they're not selling very well, actually, because the Chinese don't like round-shaped buildings, and uh, they can't see the Houses of Parliament, so... Um, um, they're not selling very well. So there's a few left. Um, anyway, the thing about these students and you know, what struck me when I was over here three weeks ago and uh, with Owen we cycled to, to the university, which uh, is an amazing 15,000 students you got out there. Uh, not 15,000 18 to 23 year old drug taking layabouts, are they? Like at King's Cross. These, the thing about students, particularly these lot, they're all bloody optimistic. They all think they're going to get a job, and maybe they will. But they've, they've got this kind of joie de vie, you know, they, they kind of cheer everyone up. You know, you see some of these people, you know, walking into Central St. Martins, you know, and they are wearing some very weird stuff. And you just got to, you know, you kind of laugh or smile. And that, you know, that's infectious, you know, that kind of, you know, joy. So, you know, just get students, you know, 
get more students, you know, bring them in, engage them in the public realm. They're not all horrible. Most of them are actually trying to behave very well and try and get a job. So um, they've become quite boring, actually, sometimes. But anyway, they're all optimistic. Next one, Jonathan. Um, there isn't enough retail at King's Cross for various reasons I won't bore you, so we, uh, we engaged um, someone I've known for a long time, very privileged to know, a chap called Thomas Heatherwick, who did the Olympic cauldron for a 2012 Olympics. He's done lots of other wonderful things. Um, so we're working with him at King's Cross on this um, addition to the, to the heritage uh, to, to try and get people to, to come there uh, and spend money and spend time. Next one, please, John. Um, so here I am. Uh, thanks for reminding everyone, David, 30 blooming years uh, down the line, um, 18 years since started at King's Cross, which incidentally is only halfway through. Um, is it getting easier? Well, those schemes in the 80s at King's Cross that didn't get planning, one of those developers spent £55 million not getting planning, designing a scheme. King's Cross planning application process cost us £35 million. You know, these are, these are big investments. Uh, and it's not, the answer is it's not getting easier. It's getting, it's getting more complex uh, in many ways, in most ways, and more expensive which comes back to the affordability of, of, of everything. Next one, Jonathan. Um, so here I am. You know, I think for the past at least 30 years of, of my working life, I've had the best job in the UK. Um, I think I've definitely got the best job in the UK again at the moment. Um, got 47 acres at Canada Water now, David, not 46, because we've just bought a police station, um, which is um, hot off the press news. Um, King's Cross, 56 acres, Canada Water, 47. Next one, please. Um, we've got themes like at King's Cross. You know, if you can get families with young children to, to want to come there and children feel safe and children can play, um, you tend to get repeat visits. And actually, if you see children playing with parents, it tends to stay clean and safe, nice place to be. Um, and I don't know whether when I started King's Cross, just because I had young children, I was fascinated with children and play. And now I'm old, I'm fascinated with elderly. But actually, there's, there's a huge crossover between accessibility uh, and just you know, wonderful public realm, and actually watching kids and you know, being able to push people around. Or, you know, why don't we start having a mobility scooter races in some of our public realm? You know, well, and the kids could watch that. They could go, look, there's granddad you know, going around in a scooter, you know, two wheels. But, other big issues, uh, physical health, mental health, social connections. Uh, just some frightening statistics. Next one, please, John. Um, and these are some of, some of the huge issues. Uh, you know, we know the, um, the demographic kind of time bomb of elderly care. Uh, the World Health Organization, top right, say that uh, air pollution is the biggest challenge for um, the world community at the moment. In Britain, it's not. Still a big issue. In Britain, it's inactivity. It's obesity. In Britain, it's the biggest health challenge. Um, but affordability and loneliness, lack of social connections, you know, the meaning of life. Am I appreciated? You know, am I doing something worthwhile? Next one, uh, So is development going to solve all these problems? No. Nope. But you know, it, can, it can be part of the conversation. Uh, and because these are new projects, you know, they get people's interest. Uh, and we can do things differently. And, and Southwark Council, where um, uh, this 46, 47 acres is, um, has produced, like we did at King's Cross, you know, we produced our own vision document. They've produced a very good vision document. If any of you are planners, you know, have a look at the Canada Water Area Action Plan. I think it's one of the best um, public documents I've seen about planning and visioning. Next one, please, John. Uh, but this is Canada Water today, parts of it, place evolution. Uh, for various reasons. Low density cul-de-sac housing uh, was produced. Uh, next one, please, John. Uh, as I've said, you know, there's always a place. Uh, we're going to evolve it, uh, not make a new place. Next one. Uh, we've got uh, the first in-town, out-of-town Tesco store, developed in 1986, opened by um, Cecil Parkinson. Does anyone remember Cecil Parkinson? What happened? You don't remember that, do you? So I won't tell you that joke. I think I'll tell you after. It's quite funny. Um, next one. Uh, we have these leisure boxes. 
quite successful. It's very suburban in a very urban part of London. Next. Uh, we have this old print works next. Um, but that's where Canada Water is. You only have to go up five stories. That happens to be 25 stories and you, you get this view of central London. You get on a bicycle and get to the Bank of England in 13 minutes. Uh, you can walk to Tower Bridge in, uh, in 20. Quite an extraordinary opportunity. Next one. Um, oh, and we're connected to 64 acres of park, literally connected. Now we've bought the police station. Next one. Uh, we're connected, literally. Our land goes onto that 24 acre dock. Next one. Uh, there's a lot of heritage there. Germans deposited 19,130 bombs, apparently, in the Blitz on the Rotherhive in Bermondsey. Wasn't much left, but you know, there was a lot of activity. <laughs> Next. Uh, oh, we're also connected into a 32-acre woodland and an 8-acre ecology park. Literally, our land adjoins it. Oh, and in the print works, that horrible old industrial building, we're doing some quite interesting uh, cultural uh, activities. Next one. Um, and because I like heritage and we didn't have any, we bought the next door listed dock office, which incidentally was the first building to be hit by a German bomb in the Blitz on September the 7th, 1940, and there's a blue plaque outside. Um, next one, please. Um, and we have Brunel's Tunnel, the first underground tunnel, just literally 300 metres from us. Next one. Um, and again, we are trying to inform the debate uh, with a similar document uh, out on the web. We're talking to people. Uh, next one, please. Uh, and we're doing a lot of that because uh, there's a lot of good ideas out there. Next one. Um, and going to schools and young people, engaging people that don't normally participate in, in these kind of things. Next one. Um, and yes, we are on Master Plan 25, uh, and we think we've cracked it. Uh, we think we've now got a master plan that can create something quite unique uh, builds on the heritage, uh, looks at the surrounding communities and enables us to, to deliver big phases in an economically viable way. Next one, please. Um, so we're looking at refurbishing the print works, bringing it back to life uh, as corporate workspace, not offices now, it's called workspace apparently. Uh, and we've got some amazing conversations with some world, world sized companies uh, and we're looking at converting the the, uh, the other half of the print works into a permanent venue for culture. Next one. Um, and this is the entrance in next one with a kind of a forest, you know, walk to work through a forest as you go up into the printing hall. Next one. New buildings, talking to universities about um, uh, coming to Canada Water. Next. Uh, next, health and leisure centres. Next. Um, and back to Mr. Heatherwick again. This is kind of hot off the press. Um, i.e. it's confidential. Um, has this been broadcast worldwide? I think I probably just uh, made an error there, haven't I? But anyway, we're working with some secret uh, designer to come up with a concept that we haven't quite established. Um, we've got um, 16 uh, roof gardens that go up one story at a time. And instead of uh, choosing an international part of the world, such as South Africa or Australia or Singapore or... You know, wherever, for these gardens and go, we've got this world gardens. We've decided to go to the North Downs, which is just outside London, which is 600 feet high. And we've got a journey down the North Downs. Uh, it's a lot cheaper, really. It's a lot cheaper in terms of visits. It's a lot cheaper in terms of we can just go and lick some stuff, you know, from the top of the North Downs. Um, and we're going to work with the local ecology groups and kids. Anyway, next one, please. Um, and the King's Cross, the brief was, let's do the biggest fountain in the world by area, which for a while we did. Uh, and the brief at Canada Water is, let's do the biggest urban waterfall. Uh, that happens to be Angel Falls. Um, and I think Sheila, well, I know Sheila's getting very impatient there. You've got lots of questions, and I have got lessons here, but we can talk about lessons when we're, um, when we're down there. Is that a good idea? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the last one you'll be pleased to know. Especially those of you who have had beer before you arrive. <laughs>